Um, the organization is a similar situation. If you look at the complaint, you'll see <laughs> that the same agency principles were discussed in the complaint. Uh, and for the, they were dressed, the, the Panthers were dressed in a trade dress of the organization. Uh, the, the Panthers had announced before the election, I believe the, the week before the election, October 28th perhaps, that they were going to have a nationwide deployment of 300 Panthers at polls. And so, you, and this was on the Black Panther webpage, it's probably still there if someone looks. So when you have an organization, whether it's the KKK or the Black Panthers or the Aryan Nation announcing before an election that they're going to do X, and then on election day X occurs, as Mr. Katz has testified, it might create agency liability for that organization. In an interview that Malik Zulu Shabazz gave on Fox News several days after the election, he indicated that the reason Black Panther members were at the polling place and armed was because of the presence of skinheads and white supremacists. Did you all look into those allegations? Well, that's one of the questions about the extent and nature of the department's investigation I will not answer, but I can say that no credible public information has ever appeared to establish there were skinheads. If you listen to that interview, and you may get to this in your question, next question, uh, Mr. Sh uh, Malik Shabazz said on Fox News that the use of the uh, weapons, I believe, was an emergency response. That, again, he was endorsing the behavior of the Panthers on Election Day in Philadelphia. So, uh, you know, you have, you have him on national television saying that he was involved in this incident in Philadelphia in one, one way or another. In the J memo, it's indicated that you actually talked to Malik Zulu Shabazz. Is that accurate? Well, the J memo probably says that. I haven't looked at it for a long time, but if I won't dispute that. Okay. Did did you actually talk to him, and what what was said? I, I did talk to him. And did he defend uh, the presence of the Panthers at the polling place? Yes, and he said the weapon was necessary. In your um, some of your recent writings. Uh, you indicated that there were prior acts of the Black Panthers at polling places during the primaries. Could you tell us about that? I can. And let me stress that this is very preliminary, and this is also in the public domain if anybody cares to actually do some work and look at it. Um, there were indications, and I will, I will concede indications is not admissible evidence, admissible evidence, but indications are where every single case starts. Um, there were indications that the Black Panthers uh, were also doing the same thing to supporters of Hillary Rodham Clinton in the primaries, uh, through, especially and particularly, I believe, in March and April of 2008. Um, those were simple indications that certainly would have been followed up on at some point by me, because I don't ever leave any stone unturned on these kind of cases, if it had gone forward. Um, had there been a uh, beginning of this activity going back into the primaries, it would have been very, very significant from my view to what was happening on Election Day. When did you become aware, though, of alleged acts during the primary? Before uh, the prosecution of this case? I can't re No, it was certainly not before. It never came to my attention before the prosecution of this case. But at some point in 2009, um, I picked up on some information that indicated this behavior was happening well before November 4th. Now, on their website, um, the date is in question, but the Black Panthers renunci allegedly renunciated the acts that occurred on Election Day and also suspended Jerry Jackson and King Samir Shabazz. Was there any indication that that occurred, these acts occurred directly as a result of the election, you know, like right after Election Day, or that it occurred only after the lawsuit was filed? I, I think it only occurred after we started calling Malik Zulu Shabazz to talk to him. I mean, that's my view. You, uh, one, of the, one of those uh, comments uh, renunciating the event uh, was dated, anyway, Election Day. Do you have any indication whether that actually occurred on Election Day or whether it was posted sometime and just backdated? Uh, whether or not this information was on the web for the public to consume on Election Day or shortly thereafter or on January 4th when the lawsuit was filed, I cannot conclusively answer with certainty. At this point, I'd like to walk through some of the chronology of the Panther case, and uh, we have up on the screen some of the, the more uh, important dates, but uh, just, you should have it also in front of you, but let me uh, walk you through. Um, first off, the suit gets filed, the defendants are served, but they don't file an answer, correct? 
That's correct. They, they didn't file an answer. There's no answer in the public record. And the failure to file an answer under Federal Rule uh, 8 means that liability is conceded, right? All facts as pled are taken in favor of the plaintiff in that circumstance. On, as, as indicated, on April 28th, the record that we have received uh, indicates that notices were sent to the defendants of the department's intent to seek a default judgment. But press reports indicated something occurred on April 29th with regard to an objection by Mr. Rosenbaum. Can you tell us about that? Um, I really can't. I mean, I, I, again, I'm not going to discuss the internal deliberations that went on, and particularly this time period, um, about the merits of those deliberations. I'm not going to talk about what the arguments were on each side. Uh, I just, I, as I've stated in my opening, uh, while I may not concede that that's deliberative process at this point, I'm nonetheless going to respect the department's uh, position that that's deliberative process. All right. This is part of a, a press report that occur, occurred in the Weekly Standard. Um, let me just ask you, factually, did Mr. Rosenbaum note an objection <coughs> that date? Well, I think Mr. Perez told you that he did, and I'd have no reason to differ with that testimony of Mr. Perez. And was that the first objection noted by anyone higher up? I, I'm not sure if April 28th is the date, but um, uh, suffice to say, uh, we were proceeding, as the public record shows in the court files, we were proceeding along merrily up until this point. Okay. The press reports also indicate that that date, the date that Mr. Rosenbaum first raised an objection, the trial team prepared a response. Was this in the form of a memorandum or an email? Uh, probably both. Did you ever receive a response? I never received a communication from uh, Mr. Rosenbaum. Now, your position is that you're not going to tell us what the uh, basis of the objections were? Well, I mean, listen, you had the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights come here and tell you a whole litany of things that justify dismissing the case. Facts and law, First Amendment, agency, all those things. Um, let's just put it this way. Those are not new arguments to me. Okay. The press reports that... Uh, the same article that I referenced before from the Weekly Standard also indicated that right after Mr. Rosenbaum made his objections, after a response was prepared by the trial team, there was, quote, two days of yelling. <laughs> Can you confirm that? Um, yelling was part of it. <laughs> uh, there were other things, profanity, uh, tossing of papers at each other, uh, all-nighters. All nighters by the trial team defending, the, defending their position. Correct. In any case, on May 1st, the motion to extend the deadline was filed uh, to evidently give more time. Is that uh, correct for the department to consider what it's going to do? The face of the pleading, I believe, states that due to the weighty issues involved in this case, we need more time to consider what would be an appropriate remedy. Okay. So the department buys itself an extra 15 days. That's right. And during that 14 days, what occurs? More of the same. Well, let me show you, uh, or you should have in front of you what's marked as Exhibit B, which is a, um, a remedial memorandum uh, dated May 6, 2009, which we have received as part of our investigation. Is that an accurate copy of that memorandum? I suppose it is. It doesn't look... Uh I mean, I have no reason to dispute its accuracy. Okay. Again, on the front, it indicates that Mr. Coates, Mr. Popper, yourself, and Mr. Fisher all join in support of the memorandum. Is that correct? As I stated, it is customary practice in the department to not attach somebody's name to a document with which they disagree. <coughs> that, that memorandum, if you won't talk about it, uh, the public can at least review the memorandum, and it points out or addresses a variety of arguments, including First Amendment concerns. One of the matters that Mr. Perez testified about was Rule 11. And he made public comments before Congress indicating that there are Rule 11 concerns. Could you describe for the public yeah. what Rule 11 is and why that might have uh, caused consternation among the trial team? Yeah, this is, this is an a, a issue near and dear to my heart. Rule 11, uh, any lawyer knows, is an ethical obligation to only sign a complaint that, or a pleading that can be supported by the facts of the law. 